Morning. So glad you all are here. Have you ever seen someone come back to life? Or have you ever died and come back to life? I mean, maybe you've heard some stories about, you know, someone's heart stopping for a few minutes and, you know, maybe them coming back after a minute or two. But have you ever heard of anybody coming back to life after three days of being dead? Only one person I know of, and his name is Jesus. Man, okay, Romans 8, 11 says this, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I want to dwell in him because I want to come back to life. I don't know if that's just me or if y'all are as excited about that as me, but this is what I want. I want to be living in Jesus so that I have the resurrection from the dead just like him. We're going to sing a song called Praise the King, and we sing Hallelujah, He's Alive. And you know what? That Hallelujah, He's Alive means if you're sharing, if you're dwelling in Him, you can sing that you're sharing in that Hallelujah, I'm alive too. So would y'all just praise our Jesus this morning with us? Let's sing together. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we Sing on through the night. There's a reason why hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Praise the King. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Dead or made alive. There's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Oh, he's alive. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. saints are roaring hill where is your victory that where is your sting the green could not ignore it all of heaven's roaring hill where is your victory that where is your sting the world could not ignore it when all the saints are roaring King, he is risen. Praise the King, he's alive. Praise the King, death's defeated.
above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And now my heart will sing how great is our God. The splendor of Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. Oh, how great is our God. Our God, and oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Oh, age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God in three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Go. my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. In Proverbs 30, it says this, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind uh, in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Do you know? Surely you do, right? Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, that's the name we're talking about, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
the Father. That is why we're here this morning. I'm going to let my knee bow to the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to praise him while I'm here on earth. I'm going to get used to it because I want to be doing this for thousands and millions of years in heaven. It's going to be a great and amazing time. We're going to sing about that wonderful name that is highly exalted. Let's sing together. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the foes. I stand at the rain. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name of all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand again. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. You have no rival, no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. For nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. Is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me? He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. Um, 
I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as a rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection.
Lord Jesus, I pray that that is all of our hearts this morning, those that are in this place and watching online, Lord, that we're singing out, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I thank you for that cross. Lord, have your way with us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Second Winter. You know, the first day of spring is Monday, tomorrow. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 this morning. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. In fact, I know you just sat down, so I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's all stand as I read. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers, beware of the mult, uh, mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Amen. You may be seated. That phrase, that I may know him, that's what I want to focus on this morning. Because knowing Christ, we could just keep verse 10 up there. Knowing Christ is extremely personal. I want you to see this. It's know whom? Him. It ain't it. It's him. This is the difference between us and the whole world of religions. They're about rules and, about, and we're about relationship with a person. And to really know him means to know him as your Lord and Savior. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, To many on judgment day will say to me, Lord, Lord, and he will say what? I never knew you. And they will be cast into hell. By the way, I read that the Pope recently said that hell is not a place. He's wrong. Amen? Don't get caught up in that foolishness. You can look that up on Google it and hear the whole interview if you would like. And this proves the most scary point. It's very possible to know about Christ. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. But not know Christ. I knew you not. Many people know about the historical Jesus. But they don't know the personal Jesus. I, have, I think it's funny as people come to church. I don't know what's going on. It's like something was drawing me. No, something wasn't. Someone was. And his name was Jesus. That's what was drawing you here. Yeah. How many of you were saved later in life? You probably knew about Jesus before you were born again. But now you know him for real. How many of you know Joe Biden? Would you like to? Well, you probably know about him, right? Like simple fact. Where was he born? Oh, anyway, so nobody knows. How has he helped you? This is not working uh, as an illustration. The point is you know about him. But unless you meet him, you don't know him personally. And sadly, most of our nation know about Jesus. They just don't know Jesus. Do you have a personal relationship with God or do you, do you just know about him? A second point to ponder. You can know Christ personally, but not know him 
intimately. And if we really want revival, then we need to know him more. Did you hear me? If we really want revival, then we need to know him more. And this, this is where Paul stands out. You know, this epistle, Philippians, it's part of the epistles when we put them together we call them the prison epistles by the way epistles are not the wives of the apostle just to get that clear this is the he wrote this paul wrote this from jail in rome waiting his own execution he is at the end of his life and his intense desire isn't to break out and live his intense desire is to know christ more intimately he wants more and more about jesus second peter chapter 3 verse 18 but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ how do you get to know him better pastor i'm glad you asked church you get to know him better through his word and we get to know him better through prayer and we get to know him better through choosing to walk this life with him hand in hand. And we can then be conformed to his image. I have been privileged for, to know him for many, many years. Y'all need to listen close now because I'm going to tell some truth. But the truth is that it's been in sorrow and loss and suffering that I have come to know him best as my comforter. Amen? And it's in times of need that I've come to know him as my provider. Amen? It is in times of persecution that I've come to know him as a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen? And it's in times of attack that I've come to know that he is my defender. Amen? And it's in times of distress that I've come to know that he is my deliverer. Amen? And I feel I've only touched the hem of his garment of what it means to know Christ intimately. Knowing Christ is personal. And knowing Christ is extremely powerful. To know him and the power of his resurrection. Power, Greek, dunamis. That's where we get the word dynamite. How many of you just thought about dynamite when I said that? <laughs> if you're young, you have no idea what we're laughing at. <laughs> he still does commercial, never mind. If we're born again... We begin the process of learning how weak we are and how powerful God is. Here's what we find out, or maybe it's just me. We can't overcome temptation in our own strength. Just me? You all found that out too. We can't deal with the stresses of life by ourselves. We live in an age of great power and technology, and we're pretty proud of ourselves NASA rockets have millions of pounds of thrust. And what's really cool are those amazing giant crawlers that they have that drag the rockets out on the launch pad, get like, like uh, 35 feet per gallon, and they, they slowly go out there. It, it, our, every one of our submarines carries hundreds of times more nuclear power than what was dropped on Japan in World War II. And yet compared to the power of God, a NASA rocket or a nuclear bomb is, is, is like a paper airplane and a BB gun. What kind of power are we talking here? It's very specific. The power of his resurrection. Oh, we think of God's power, and the first thing we think about is, well, his power in creation. It's awesome. He just spoke, and it all came into existence. And with all our scientific knowledge, we can't even study our own sun well enough to know the extent of its power and according to what I've been reading, that's just one of like zillions and zillions and trillions of suns that all came into orbit, into places and planets and moons in perfect balance in an instant at the word of God. The power of his creation is awesome. And then we read about the power in judgment. As God stood toe-to-toe -to -toe against the false god of Egypt, maybe you've seen the movie, Jehovah God rained down victorious as he rained down judgment on all who would oppose him. His power and judgment is awesome. And then we've heard about the power of the virgin birth for a perfect son to be brought into the world without a need of an earthly dad. But Paul didn't say that I may know the power of creation. And Paul didn't say that I may know the power of his judgment 
or the power of the virgin birth. He wanted to know the power of his resurrection. It is the greatest display of God's power that there has ever, ever been, trumping even the creation of the universe. For resurrection power is power over, listen, it's power over sin and death which are the strongest foes that have ever existed in all of creation. Creation's wonderful, but it's fallen. But he can pick us up. Newsflash, every one of our lives results in death. Everyone. And we need a resurrection. And that takes a greater power than has ever existed outside of the one who is the eternal life giver, Jesus Christ. Up from the grave he arose, a mighty triumph for his foes, resurrection power. Paul says, in jail, I need access to that kind of power. I need to plug in to that power source. Why? Because Paul knew that man can control an entire ship with just a small rudder, but he can't control his own tongue. Today we can guide rovers remotely on Mars and cruise around on the surface and pick up pieces of dirt and send them home, but we can't guide our families in our own houses without the power of God. And we've learned how to cure lots of diseases, but we can't keep our mind off of lust. We need help. We need God's Medical science has revealed that the electrical power in the human body, our nervous system, is about 100 watts. How foolish is it to rely on the power of our human flesh when we can avail ourselves of God's resurrection power? It's time for the light bulb to come on as we realize we need him. We work, we struggle, and strive in our own power. For what? For failure. Let's tap into God's resurrection power. Imagine I come in here on a Wednesday night for our prayer meeting and it's totally dark in here. And I'm like, hey, anybody in here? Oh, yeah, we're here. We're ready to start. And I'm like, well, why is it dark? Is the power out? No. Are there lights in the light in the sockets? There? Yes. Is the light switch broken? We don't know. Well, let me try it. Blink. And we're like, that's why you're the pastor. No, no. It's a ridiculous situation. And it's the one we find ourselves in as weak humans who don't make the, take the simple step to flip the switch of God's power. Knowing Christ is personal. And knowing Christ is powerful. And it's also painful. Look at the last part of verse 10. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Isaiah 53 verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus new pain the emotional pain of rejection by his own people by his own friends that he came to save his own disciples forsook him pain from slander as they called him illegitimate and a drunk and demon possessed it hurts to be lied about and jesus lived his whole life under that cloud and jesus knew physical pain not just the pain of the cross We forget how much worse every pain in life was for the simple fact that Jesus lived in a sinless body. Why do I say that? Because of this. You see, sin has this dulling effect on us. It desensitizes us. It has a desensitizing effect on our bodies. So when they drove the crown of thorns into his head, it was worse because that was a perfect head that never had a thought of sin. When his hands were nailed to the cross, Those were hands that had never done any wrong or handled anything sinfully. When his feet were nailed, they had never gone anywhere they shouldn't go. And when his side was pierced near his heart, it it was worse because that's a pure heart that has never once, not one beat for the devil. And Jesus knew the worst pain of all, spiritual pain, as his own father separated himself from the son on the cross forsaking him as all of our sin was laid upon him that's true death separation from god that's what hell is in addition to being a literal fire darkness and torment and gnashing of teeth no matter what you might read on the news separation from god spiritual pain 
that cannot be comprehended. It says the fellowship of his sufferings. Fellowship, you know what that is? That's joint participation. Paul said it was a privilege to know some small portion of what suffering is for the appreciation it gave him for his Savior. It was in Paul's suffering that he got to know Jesus more intimately. So let me pose a very tough question for you. What are you willing to endure if God can use it to draw you more close to him? We sang this little, little bit ago, he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. I, I asked Luke to include that song or I gave him a list of songs. Do you know who wrote that? Fanny Crosby. You know anything about her? When you see this, the hymns that she wrote, you can clearly see that this woman knew Jesus intimately. We can see that, but she couldn't see it. She's blind. And the blindness was thrust upon her forcefully by the wrong medicine being put into her little eyes as a child. And she could have lived her life as a victim, seeking pity. But instead, when her physical eyes were blinded, her spiritual eyes were opened. Because of the darkness of her physical suffering, her spiritual eyes were open. In the furnace of affliction, she was purified as gold. It was on the rack that God stretched her into a spiritual giant that she became. Knowing Christ is personal and it's powerful and it's painful and it's also purposeful. The last part, being conformed to his death. The three greatest questions that plague the minds of all mankind. Here we go. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? Universal. And the world has no answer because they refuse the answers that are found in the Word of God. And this is the reason today that so many people are empty and lonely and the suicide rate is so high and those who don't take their own lives meander about like the walking dead because they have no purpose for living. They're a wandering generality or one of those Plinko games where it just go tink, tink, tink until you're deposited at the lowest spot without aim or purpose. But this verse makes it clear what our purpose is. You're not going to like this. Death. But it's talking about death to self. When we die of our own ambition and live for something greater than ourselves, then we begin living. You want resurrection power? You can't have erection unless there's death first. Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass. I read this yesterday at a wedding. Darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. Then we will know him as he is intimately. Do you know about Christ? Do you know him personally? And if you know him personally, do you know him intimately? And are you willing to experience the fellowship of his sufferings if that's what it takes to know the power of his resurrection? And then you can find your purpose for living. I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to be in the front ready to receive any one of you who would like to come forward for prayer. This is an opportunity uh, for prayer. If I have more than one or two people up, I'll ask a deacon or someone else to come up and pray with me. If you've never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, if what you're hearing today sounds, that's pretty cool, I never heard that before, I want to tell you something. You were drawn here by a person and his name is Jesus. This Jesus lived a perfect life. He was born of a virgin. He never sinned. Then he was arrested under some false trials, was beaten, mocked, cursed, and then he was nailed to a cross. And there he willingly gave up his spirit. And on that cross, the wrath of God for all of our sin was poured about out on him. And then they took him off that cross and they buried him in, or put him in a, a, a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, they went back to get him. He's gone because he was resurrected. And the Bible says he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. 
He did all of that. So you could be here today and hear little old Pastor Rob tell you that Jesus loves you so much he gave his life for you that you could spend eternity with him. How do you do that? It says in the Bible very simply, if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. That's how. I know you want a list. You want a list of the 15 things you need to do to get saved. And then you want a measurement to make sure you're there. It's not how it works in God's economy. It's a free gift. There's nothing you could do or you would boast about it. It is a free gift given to you by God. All it takes is faith. Here's how you do it. I'm going to just give you an example, but you need to do it on your own because God has no grandchildren. Every one are personally his. What you do is you pray a prayer that says something simple like this. It's like, Lord, I'm a sinner. You don't need the list. You've already seen it. And I know I can't save myself, and I want my sins to be forgiven. So I'm putting my faith in you and you alone for the forgiveness of my sins and the salvation of my soul. If you pray that prayer today, while we're having this time of invitation, the Bible says that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Not only are you sealed by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has sealed you and he's sealing you. That means that never again can you be taken from the hands of God. Your salvation is secure. Who do you think you are that you could give it away? It's a free gift of God, not of Rob. Amen? And then you can spend the rest of your life being conformed to the image of God, being, being from, from day to day made better and better. You aren't going to smell any better tomorrow, and your friends might not like you anymore, but your salvation will be secure because the Holy Spirit of God will be in your body. We talked last week about, or was it Wednesday night? Recently, we talked about us being containers, vessels. We are, every one of us. We're made leaky. And the only thing that can fill us up is the Spirit of God. And this is your opportunity to do that. As the band plays, sing along with them, stand, raise your hands, say amen. Come forward and pray with me. Come forward and pray with the altar. But this is your time to get personal and intimate and to know the Lord your God. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Just as I am and waiting now to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee. Each spot, O oh Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a Fightings and fears within, without, O oh Lamb of God, I come, I come, oh, just as I am for I said if you felt drawn, it wasn't something that was drawing you, it was someone. You also need to know this. If you feel like you can't get out of that chair, there's not something holding you back. It's someone. His name is Satan. 
If you need to come up and pray, you don't let the seatbelt of the enemy come out of that chair and keep you there. This is our time of worship, and we own this place in the name of Jesus. all stand together and sing one more verse of just as I am. We thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the prayers that have happened in this place. And Father, we pray for those who were not able to get out of the chair. Father, I pray that their fellowship with you where they sat is personal and intimate. Father, as we do every time the church prays, we pray for revival in our nation. We pray, Lord, for those who are empowered, that they would be guided by your Holy Spirit and they would make decisions that are pleasing to you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Just be seated for a few minutes. I'm going to go through the announcements and we'll close with one more song. First of all, to all 20 of the contestants that entered the chili cook-off on Monday, awesome. What a great job. We had over 100 people. I don't know how many people we had here. We had, it was like overrun and there were like 20 really, really good chilies. I'm not even going there. I was just so, so thankful for the, the fellowship that we have in this church, which bl brings me to the next exciting chapter of cooking competitions at First Baptist Seabrook. On April 24th, our drummer Jason is going to lose his gumbo championship. So the sign-up is on the bulletin board uh, for the uh, gumbo cook-off on April 24th. If you want to participate, please sign up. Uh, let's see what else. Wednesday, men uh, normal. Actually, we have a little special... Uh, Steve Bellistrieri, who my wife lovingly calls Chef Boyardee, uh, is making meatballs. We're having meatball sandwiches on Monday night, so it's going to be awesome. If you haven't had their, their meatballs, they're super good. Uh, Wednesday night, regular schedule. Sign up for the extravaganza. Uh, volunteers is in the hallway. You also might notice that in the back of our property, there are three crosses in the ground. What's cool about them is that Jesus isn't on them. He came off the cross, and he's not a crucifix, right? That's, we're look, working on having like stations of the cross kind of idea when we do our extravaganza so people have a visual of the whole Easter story because as much fun as it is for a, it ain't about eggs, people, and it's not about a bunny either. It's about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what we want to share with the community. And there's no reason why we can't do both at the same time. Amen? So check out our crosses. David Tate put them in. They're, they're awesome. Uh, there's handles so we can put somebody up there. That's so cool. Um, what other announcements do we have? Uh, ladies, we're good uh, tonight at 5 and Thursday at 10. Any other announcements that need to be made? Okay, volunteers for the extravaganza meeting after the second service next Sunday. Short meeting. Any others? What about birthdays? Excellent. Nobody was born. 
Oh, Amanda's birthday was like two days ago or yesterday? Oh, we sang last week? So you'd be embarrassed if we sang again? Okay, we won't do it. All right. Trish, is it your birthday? All right, Trish's birthday. We got one in the back row. Here we go, all together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Let's all stand together as the praise band leads us in the song, and then Luke will close us out. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, oh Jesus Christ. about the Lord as you leave. Don't immediately talk about the weather. Talk about the Lord. Remember his goodness. Y'all have an amazing